I know, right? It's been it's been forever since I posted a video, like a while and a half ago. Quite a while ago, in fact. Uh, well, what can I say? School keeps me busy, right? Undergrad problems. <laughs> um, but hey, on the subject of education, um, a friend of mine, uh, a friend of mine from the military, uh, someone I was in Iraq with, decided to continue his education, is cashing in his uh, GI Bill. And for the degree plan that he's going for, one of the prereqs that he has to take is a basic drawing class, even though he wants to go into um, digital imagery, digital media, um, game design, and whatnot kind of stuff. Um, I, I don't know the specifics exactly, because this isn't at the same school that I go to. But <laughs> before I ramble on too much, I thought that uh, as an artist, type person and as a battle buddy I would help square him away so this video is well it's basically drawing shit 101 for lack of better terminology so what you would think of um, my my art school horror story was 15 years ago uh, what you would think of as drawing or what you would think of as art some people would say, oh, I'm not very good at drawing, you know, I, I, there just aren't enough erasers, I can't draw people, but I can draw stick figures, I hear shit like that all the time. But really, those aren't bad places to start. Um, thing is, what I think a lot of people don't understand about drawing things well is that really what you're doing is you're taking something that you're looking at, or you're taking something that you're thinking of, and you're attempting to translate it onto a two-dimensional surface of some kind, be it paper or canvas or even uh, the screen of a tablet or, uh, or your computer screen. So to start with, I'm just going to introduce you all to a variety of different materials that can be used for just basic drawing, how to survive an art class. These are materials that you'll probably be looking to purchase soon. Um, if you want to really learn a variety of different ways and how to best how to find out what works best for you and how to best utilize the skills that you learn now, on the subject of erasers these are the three different kinds aside from whatever happens to be on the edge of your pencil these are three different kinds that you're probably going to wind up using fairly frequently um, these are gum erasers, and these are fantastic, but they're kind of expensive. And I like them very much because they are meant to be pulled apart and fucked with a little bit. And these are great that you can get into all kinds of little shapes, like a nice, neat, clean little edge, like you see there. I, I know that that looks kind of um, messed up, but uh, that nice, clean, neat little edge there for if you have to erase a very delicate line or a very small area. You, with these kinds of erasers, these are not meant to be pressed really hard against a surface because as you can see, all that does is just squash the nice clean edge that you just made. What you wanna do is just take the nice little bit or, or whatever shape you, you did and you just want to get that closer to a point there. You just wanna gently gently drag it against the surface without pressing so hard that you fuck up your shape so that you just create a nice clean little spot of whatever it is that you're trying to erase um, my friend told me I'm not good at drawing because there just aren't enough erasers actually maybe at some point later on I'll show you how to make drawings with erasers by basically covering a sheet of paper with like charcoal for days and then using erasers like these with which to draw lines and shapes. Um, this is an this is called an art gum eraser, not to be confused with this gum eraser. And uh, these these aren't bad. I find that they my my experience I find that they work pretty well with graphite, not so much with charcoal. Uh, they they tend to spread charcoal around a bit, which it's kind of the fun with charcoal, and I will show you that, um, why I love drawing with charcoal so much. Um, 
this particular eraser is okay to be used for like big flat spaces and you can just go ahead and just like press this right up against the surface of the paper to try to erase shit um, to do what you've got to do. Uh, and this, you know, to be honest, I don't really use all that much. Because honestly, this is just my opinion, but there's nothing this can't do that this already can't. I just keep it in my school bag for if I fuck something up on a, an exam and need to erase it because I take exams in uh, regular number two pencil for because that's just what I do. This right here is really no different than this right here, in my opinion. Now, um, when I mentioned that you can draw pictures using erasers, I'm a big fan of this one right here. Uh, as with anything that is not food uh, or intended to be consumed, keep out of reach of animals and small children, because um, that, that, that would just be a bad idea. Uh, these can be purchased individually at most art supply stores, Amazon, or your university bookstore. My recommendation is to get a couple of these, especially if you're going to be drawing with uh, graphite and charcoal, because you will be going through quite a few of them. Now, on the subject of charcoal, since I mentioned it, there's two different kinds of um, charcoal products that you will probably be working with in an art class or a studio class environment. Regular old charcoal sticks, which um, this package is kind of old. This uh, It came out of this box that was part of a Christmas gift someone gave to me some many, many years ago, as you can see by the faded price tag and packaging. Um, these are wonderful. They tend to they tend to use up pretty quickly though. The nice thing about these is that if you if you're in a situation where you need to draw something that involves big broad strokes on the um, on the surface or heck even on a canvas I know that's that's super unorthodox and technically cheating but um, that's what I use these for these are that's what they're great for. These are great for getting nice big broad surfaces and they come in a variety of different sizes. These are just run-of-the-mill ordinary sized willow charcoal sticks. And the nice thing is is that as you draw with them they get this uh, these worn down slightly worn down tips that if you just watch the end of it as I rotate um, they change shape as you work with them. But these are not compressed. These are pretty much straight, sold as seen, exactly what you're looking at. It's it's a burnt stick. Hell, I mean, you don't technically have to go buy these. In theory, you could just make your own by setting a piece of wood on fire. But, you know, I make it sound simple. Because different types of wood burn differently, obviously. But, yeah. Oh, also, thing about charcoal is uh, it's it's messy. And that, I mean, that's that's nothing. I'm surprised that there's not more powder on my fingertips. Now, these are compressed, and they are compressed inside this nice, lovely pencil format. But um, these are great for if you need to make nice, neat, clean, singular lines for some amount of detail, and they come in different hardnesses that will... Let's see if I can find... There's medium extra soft um, just like they come in different hardness hardnesses just like uh, number two pencils or graphite pencils do but the thing about these I love and hate these because they uh, they're hard for me to keep sharp right because if you look very carefully there are some that I used a regular old pencil sharpener for and then there's these bottom two here that I had to use a uh, just a, a pocket knife to sharpen because they don't, in my experience, they don't sharpen in regular pencil sharpeners very well. Not without the tips breaking or crumbling into bits because charcoal, compressed or not, uh, is still kind of frail and breaks very easily. Uh, the other thing I don't like about these is um, 
If you drop them on a solid floor like concrete or tile, the insides will break. So um, look at this. I'm pretty sure this is the one that I've dropped like 10,000 times. And um, I have to be really careful with sharpening it because if I don't do it exactly right, the tip will break off before I can actually use it. And um, because I've dropped it so many times, the inside of this is all broken up and cracked. Kind of like if you broke a bone, but the skin and muscle and fat tissue outside of your, say, your leg or your arm is still perfectly intact. You can't see that it's broken. You just know that it is. I know it was kind of a fucked up example, but uh, yeah, so that's charcoal and charcoal pencils. In my art school background, we called this a stomp. And yes, I know, it kind of looks like a really stiff joint, but it's not. If you look very carefully at, uh, at what it's made out of, it's a very tightly rolled piece of paper um, all the way out to a tip. And now what this is used for is you say you draw an area with pencil, and these can work with charcoal too, but not, in my experience, not quite as well. You want to blend or smooth out certain areas to uh, create a less sketched appearance of something and uh, make it smoother, make it blend better. And that's what you would use this for, is uh, you would either use the tip of it directly and just kind of draw over what you've already drawn to make everything blend together, or you would take this at its side and you would use nice, broad, flat areas to say, bring a whole bunch of uh, substance that you've just laid down on the surface and draw it out further across more surface area. I'll show you what that means later on. And this is just a good old standard um, mechanical pencil. And I love mechanical pencils so much because I find I can get all kinds of neat, awesome little details. And these, I like to use these the most for starting, just starting out, because they don't create that strong a line unless you press really hard, which for a mechanical pencil is difficult to do without breaking it, but you get just enough line to get the right idea of what you're supposed to be doing before you can really finish the rest of it. And that's pencils. Next up is ink, and I've actually... Uh, this is one of my favorites next to charcoal to work with because I just like the nice, clean look of black ink on white paper. Or uh, calligraphy also. Um, Japanese and Arabic calligraphy is just... I've always found it to be striking and just beautiful and charming. And I could stare at a carefully drawn word for hours and just marvel at it, honestly. But... <laughs> I'm rambling on here. So here I have um, two different kinds of ink. Uh, ordinary lettering ink, which is what um, some Western style lettering and calligraphy, like think think like Book of Kells, think like um, Celtic style, medieval European style uh, calligraphy ink. This tends to be what a lot of people that I know are into that kind of thing tend to use, and here's where I might make a mess of my old uniform here, is, uh, here's the neat thing about it. If you wind up using ink, what you want to do is you want to take this dram and dunk it into the bottle, squeeze it, it's like a big eyedropper. Um, these rubber tips tend to break very easily though, so just be careful with that, and uh, don't ever pick up a thing of ink like this. Because uh, aside from the fact that I just screwed the cap back on now, you never really know how secure this shit is. Um, this is ordinary lettering ink. Now what I don't have is India ink. And I had a really nice jar of it that when I went looking through my art supplies, turns out it got old because the container got cracked, or the lid got cracked, and it dried the fuck up. And I have to go get new India ink. But India ink is more or less similar to, um, actually I would say 
in my experience, it's more close to this right here, which is semi ink, um, commonly used as far as I know in China and Japan. Uh, please correct me if I am wrong about any of this, but um, it's commonly used in Chinese and Japanese uh, ink scroll, uh, ink calligraphy. Um, again, among my personal favorite pieces of art, um, the Museum of Fine Art in Boston has a very extensive collection of uh, art from Japan to include hand-drawn uh, scrolls, calligraphy, uh, creatures, people. It's fantastic. If you ever get a chance to go to the MFA in Boston and see their Japanese wing, I very strongly recommend that you do it. It That's one of those mind-blowing, life-changing experiences. Um, anyway, now the thing is, is that this lettering ink will Adhere to, adhere to a surface in a cleaner kind of way than the sumi ink will. Sumi ink, in my experience, will absorb straight into the paper, especially if it's already wet. Sometimes you may want to do that, sometimes you may not, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Um, now, on the subject of calligraphy, uh, Chinese or Japanese calligraphy, this brush is kind of old and kind of ratted, and yes, I literally put it back together with electrical tape. Go ahead and mock me for it, I don't care. I've had this for a number of years, and this brush is supposed to be soft to the touch and just a little bit springy. That way it maintains enough shape to basically be structurally sound, but soft enough so that it doesn't spatter the ink all over the paper like a stiffer quality brush would. If you wa find yourself drawing with ink, my personal preference would be for a brush like this. Now, I have seen some, they look like an oddly cut piece of bamboo. Uh, basically, it looks like a giant bamboo quill. I have never used one of those. I have no experience with them. Um, I've used a regular lettering pen that's meant to be used with a bottle of ink like this, and that just has a metal split nib on the end of it. Um, kind of looks like a much smaller version of this, if you will. I have used something like that, and um, yeah, those, uh, those quill pens with the metal nibs, um, they are kind of expensive and they are best suited for writing rather than drawing, unless you're like a professional cartoonist or something. Uh, odds are though, when I was in art school, we didn't use nibs when it came to learning how to draw with ink. We used these. And basically, um, Google image search um, Chinese or Japanese uh, scrolls, or uh, not woodblock prints, those are different. Prints are very different from drawn uh, drawn scrolls or murals or things like that. Odds are they will have used something like a brush like this, made of similar materials, of varying sizes. Hell, um, I even have one that's... I, I have one of these that's basically uh, a really big, broad, flat one that's meant to be hold, held kind of like... Uh, it, it basically... It looks like an old-school cassette tape with bristles coming out the ends of it in a straight line. I know, that's a really weird description, but that's what it looks like. And that's ink. And finally, I've just got a mix of miscellaneous stuff here. Uh, ordinary ballpoint pens. I have... I have jars of these things because I just have so goddamn many of them. Students give out pens for their fraternities or sororities or whatever organization that they're a part of, or you can get them at Walmart. I really don't need to go into extraordinary detail explaining how they work, because pretty much everyone knows how ballpoint pens work. And yes, you can create art with ballpoint pens. I've seen it. I've done it. It is possible. You will probably not be doing that in an actual art class, though. So um, these are good to keep in mind. Uh, they're certainly handy, um, but again, in a semi-professional setting, I guess, they're not exactly ideal. Possible, but not ideal. Other miscellaneous materials, um, 
these are just these are China markers. And I don't use them terribly often, but there are other um, materials that come in formats similar to this. Now, if you look carefully at the tip of this, you'll see this string here, which is kind of hanging out and annoying. And you'll see that like the stump, it's basically just rolled paper, but it's around a substance here. And here's the really cool thing, is that once you draw with, say, a china marker or a Conte crayon, which unfortunately I don't have any of, I just have this, or um, I've even seen uh, graphite and charcoal come packaged this way. Want to see something cool? Watch this. Take the string, tug it back like a tampon. Shit. What's supposed to happen is this paper is just supposed to peel off. So sharpening it, if you will, is just a matter of a tug of the string. And of course, if the paper breaks before you get uh, to the end, you're kind of sort of fucked. See, look at that. Look at all that nice, thick, girthy material I've got to work with right at the tip. Isn't that fantastic? And your are the now generic, good old-fashioned Sharpie marker. I like keeping these in my standard drawing kit. I use them typically to actually sign pieces that I finish. Um, as far as actually putting final touches on a drawing itself, I don't see terribly many people do full-size drawings in Sharpie terribly often. Actually, there is a local woman here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, who does these really bizarre sculptures uh, where she just doodles with Sharpie all over them. Everywhere, everything from hands to flowers to ge geometric designs. A and um, shoot, unfortunately, I've forgotten her name. I met her once, uh, and she's, she's absolutely lovely. Um, Sharpie, aside from signing finished drawings, I really only ever see other artists use as kind of, well, kind of novelty. I'm sure there's, there's a way to create really amazing stuff with just about anything. But, um, yeah, so everything that you've just seen. So, yeah, uh, everything, everything you've just seen is more or less exactly what I use every time I draw. Sometimes when I paint. I'm not going to get into painting this time around because it's too soon. Okay, so now that we've discussed materials, different kinds of materials, what they're best suited for, and what they're not very well suited for, again, all of this according to my own experience, that's electrical tape, is uh, now we're actually going to start getting into um, getting a cat out of the workspace. Sorry, honey. And then the actual drawing aspect of this. So do you remember when I said that art is basically translating what you're looking at or what you are observing and translating it onto a two-dimensional surface. Uh, cheap, ordinary sketch pad, you can get them at Walmart. Hell, you could probably even find them at a dollar store. Really nothing that extraordinary. Mm, spiral bound, it's paper. Now, um, if you really want to be fancy, you can spend a ton of money on one of these moleskin, moleskine, skein, whatever the fuck the hipsters call it, uh, sketchbooks. I've had this one since I was still in the army, and um, I've, I've used it over the years for a... That's a very not nice word in Arabic. Um, <laughs> I've used it over the years to just kind of flesh out ideas. Um, it was very expensive, but it's very high quality paper, and uh, it's... The sketchbook itself is actually very durable, but um, this is one of those things I like to carry with me and uh, whenever I have an idea to just kind of sketch out, or just to kill time. Sketching in a sketchbook, especially a nice, small, easy to travel with one like this, is a great way to kill time and develop your skill. And the thing is, is that if you're worried about your drawings not being very good, this is yours. No one else has to see it, unless you want to show it to them. That's, that's the best part. But uh, for school purposes, 
you are probably going to want to get just an inexpensive, simple one, kind of like this one right here. All right, so we have here our ordinary steel teapot. There's really nothing terribly special about it, and I'm not going to worry about this uh, surface. I'm not going to worry about any of this, the wall or the closet. I live in a really cramped apartment, so I work with the space that I have. I know it's not very glamorous, but it's a roof over my head, and I'm not going to complain about that. So what we're going to do is just to start, we're going to take a good long look at the space that this teapot is occupying. It's got quite a few straight lines around its edges that define its shape, right? It's got a somewhat domed top on the lid, it's got this really narrow ass handle, and it's got this curvature at the bottom that, you know, that gives it its volume, that gives it, you know, the dimensions of the space that it's occupying. This tea kettle is an object occupying, um, occupying space. So we are going to draw just the basics of the tea kettle. And I chose this tea kettle in particular because it's, it's, ordin it's relatively plain. There's nothing terribly fancy about it. It, reflect, it refracts light very well. So here we go. Just uh, nice and simple. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to start with just a, holding a pencil like this, because when you're writing, you typically hold your pencil closer to the head. That way you can get nice, clear lettering. But to start, and so that I don't cave into temptation and press too terribly hard, I'm going to hold it further back. That way, if I fuck up, it's not pressed so hard into the paper that I can't erase it later. Um, when you're starting off... Actually, I think it's just going to be easier for me to hold it this way. When you're starting off, you don't want to press too terribly hard into the surface, so hold it further back and just make that nice, neat top line. Don't know if you can see it terribly well. The light in here isn't very good. I'll just keep going until we get a better, better feeling of what it is that we're looking at. I'm not going to worry about any of the super fine details like the spout or the handle or tipping it over and hearing it shout. So I'm just going to worry about the basic shape of the tea kettle itself and my cat is in here again. Sometimes she likes to pretend to be my little helper, if you will. Now maybe you've seen cartoons of artists doing shit like this, looking down their thumb and angling it. There's a reason why they do that. You see how at the edge of this tea kettle there's like an angled line? The reason people sometimes do that is they try to visu visually gauge what angle, you know, unless you have a protractor installed in your fucking head, where that line lines up with the pencil or line it up in their field of vision and then translate that onto the drawing surface like so. And I've completely fucked up, but that's okay because this is just a demo. This is not going to be perfect, and this is by no means the uh, the greatest capacity of what it is that I am capable of. I have actually never made an art tutorial video, ever. But depending on how well this one goes, maybe I will start. There we go, a little further out. I swear, make a happy little tree joke, you motherfucker. Mm. Actually, did you know Bob Ross used to be in the Air Force? Or was it the Marines? No, Air Force, actually. All right. The thing with objects with curves is, unless it's a, something that's just, the curves are crazy, like this is mostly cylindrical, so the curvatures should be relatively consistent in relation to the rest of the body of the object. Um, 
curvatures need to be consistent, otherwise it looks like a mess. So to try to keep your curved areas and surfaces as consistent as possible. Actually, I need to bring this out just a little bit more. Narrow this down. And this is the nice thing about having a nice, soft, not too hard pencil stroke on the surface is that all these little lines that maybe you can see me making can be much easier uh, erased later on and cleaned up and finished up. So let's keep going with the rest of the tea kettle. And eventually this all comes to a this is not a hard corner on the edge. There's a little bit of a curve here, so just nice and easy right on down the side. It's a little harder on one side than the other, but that's okay. This can be easily fixed later on. And then again, once you reach the bottom edge, try to keep your curves as consistent with everything else. Um, I have several pots and kettles. Actually, I got a really nice new copper one for Christmas, but I wanted to start with this one because, well, it's relatively simple and there's really no serious bells and whistles attached. Now I realize that the drawing isn't exact and I'm leaving, for now, I'm leaving the spout and the handle and whatnot out of it. This is just the general idea. Um, multiple lines and as you can see um, I misgaged um, the band or the, the angled band of the kettle itself at first, but uh, all these nice light little lines, I'm not pressing very hard at all, like just to show you what's up, pressing really hard creates those really dark, clearly defined lines, but enough nice light ones just to start with is better, because this is going to be a pain in the dick to erase later, and this is going to be so much easier to wipe up. Hey, <laughs> Anyway, back to the actual drawing. Now, now I'm going to try to tackle the lip of the, or the edge of the lid of this tea kettle here, because you see how, maybe you can see in the video how it pokes out just a little bit. That's what I'm going to try and go for next. Let's see. Keeping the curves consistent. Poking out just a little bit on the edge here. And just enough of a straight, just enough of a straight line up, but not enough to make the lid look thick and gigantic. Because thick and gi gi <sighs> thick and gigantic, ha ha ha, is not always the best. So just enough so that you have the lip of the kettle itself and the lid and the line where the two separate. And just enough to create the lid that fits. And now to complete the lid so that we know it's a flatter surface than the rest of the kettle. See how there are those two distinct lines there, just like you can see the darker banding here where the lid meets the rest of the kettle. Now, um, now I'm going to start with the spout. Now the spout is, on this particular kettle, is really goddamn small because this particular kettle was actually designed to be used outdoors, like for people who hike and camp a lot. Nice, small, compact, relatively lightweight. Um, like if you do a lot of hiking and camping or you know people who do, who'll probably bring something like a jet boil with them. 
you could just as easily make tea and coffee with that or you can get yourself one of these now um, another curved item in relation to another curved surface might be a little bit more difficult and the camera angle is looking at this kettle at a slightly different angle than I am I am seated what about maybe a foot to the left of my camera and I've got a cat harassing me so if you hear purring yep <laughs> that was my cat that was Mio um, yeah so I'm just gonna draw this kettle from the angle that I am looking at it and not from the angle that the cameras looking at it so if it looks completely different then um, well I'll, I'll I'll square it away don't worry so we have the tiny ass spout on this relatively lightweight compact little tea kettle and it's not quite poking out the side it's just slightly at the top of the kettle so this banded area here the bigger band at the top of it is more or less where we are going to put the spout because here's the handle and here is this I've already made that joke yeah I should just get back to drawing uh, all right so from where I am looking at this tea kettle the spout is going to be like pretty much right on the side of the drawing for the most part so nice neat little oval on the side not very big it's maybe about the size of a dime or a penny and then um, maybe it shows very well in this through the camera maybe it doesn't it's got a little bit of a lip but it's got a slight bulge kind of like a turnip or an onion shape at the base of it here and then where it meets the rest of the kettle so slight little lip it's thicker on the bottom than it is on the top and then a very slight bulge out and you see I've already made a mistake but that's okay because nice clean lines nice soft lines can be erased very easily <laughs> it's almost like there was nothing there at all all right so let's try this again so when I made that oval for the spout I actually angled it wrong I made it go st straight and in exact parallel with the band instead of curving it in slightly more so that's what I'm gonna do this time and I hope I get it right so the oval goes in slightly and then there's the little lip and then there's the bigger lip it would be physiologically easier for me to take the camera or take the kettle to the camera and show you but then I would have to reposition it in its exact place and that's just a pain in the ass and I don't want to do that and I'm lazy so there's that too consistent curvature consistent curvature and then there's the band of metal where it's affixed to the rest of the kettle kind of like uh, it looks kind of like a gasket seal I guess you could call it nice nice easy peasy there. so that's more or less from where I'm sitting that's where that that's what that tiny ass spout looks like again it's designed specifically to be very small now maybe you can see it on this camera maybe you can't uh, depending on your screen resolution but that darkness that depicts the interior space of the spout going into the kettle is actually not solid black because as you can see the angle from which the top-down angle from which light is hitting the surface of the kettle uh, it's actually creating a convex shape and appearance or excuse me um, I misspoke concave 
versus convex, which is where um, uh, bulging out versus concave, as in caved in. This is an interior space uh, through which normally there would be water. So if I were going to be showing the spout to depict a hollow object, I wouldn't just fill it in completely solid black. Maybe you can see, but instead I would just very gradually right, dark into light and then maybe a little bit at the edge as well. So you have just enough information to show very clearly that, hey, this is not a solid surface here. This is a this is where water comes out from. Because, you know, if it were a solid surface, it would be kind of fucking useless as a kettle, wouldn't it? Um Alright, so that's the spout. And now you'll notice that the top of the lid has a it looks kind of like a D-ring little handle on the top of it uh, to remove the lid and refill with water. So I'm not going to worry too much about getting absolute perfect detail here. I am just going to make a couple of marks to signify that there is something happening here. And... Uh, and trying my best to keep curvature consistent. It's not easy, but there it is, the little D-ring at the surface. And then the handle of the rest of the tea kettle. Now, there are these metal flaps here. There's a hole drilled in both of them through which the handle has been affixed. This is gonna. This is the part that I was not looking forward to because this is what usually gets me tripped up. Is that this flap here is just above the tiny ass spout and curves out and down. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a f fucked up flower petal. Uh, actually, kind of like it, it reminds me of um, the way it curves up and out the way it does. Reminds me a little bit of an orchid um, petal, a five petal Phalaenopsis orchid, like the one I have growing in my window, or the one I have tattooed on my right leg, actually. Um, let's see, and then it does the same thing on the other side. Like, see this flat upcurved shape here from where I'm sitting looks more or less like that, uh, if you can see above the spout. Right. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do the one on the other side real quick. Nice and easy to start. Nice light pencil strokes to begin. That way if I make a mistake, which I almost did just now, I can erase it without too many fucking problems. Okay, so now we have the two flaps that would hold the handle on the kettle itself. And now, just the general idea of the handle. This video is already taking a bit longer than I originally planned, so I am just going to Create some nice, simple lines. Nothing special because, and I realize that there's a divot in the top of the actual handle, but for the sake of the tutorial, I'm not going to bother. All right, so there is your basic tea kettle. Now, I've already started with the, um, since I mentioned the direction of light in relationship to the kettle, and the space that it's occupying. Light is the most important thing to keep in mind when you're drawing still life objects because your light sources should always be consistent. In my experience, you don't typically have multiple light sources interacting with the same object. Right now, I've got my ceiling light on, but I'm also sitting opposite to where the, the sun is coming straight in 
through the window and hitting this this tea kettle right where I'm tapping on it. So my back is to my window. Now, the thing with shading, as you would typically call it, although um, most artists would refer to shadow, light and shadow as a concept called value, is that um, when you are shading a three-dimensional object, you're not just fucking shading it. What you want to do, at least this is what has worked for me, is you want to take a good hard look once you get the basics, the basic form and shape of the object you're drawing out. You want to take a good long look and observe where the light is hitting it the strongest versus where there doesn't seem to be much light at all, like the spout of the kettle or toward the bottom of the kettle. Like um, on the camera, this little strip right here, there doesn't seem to be a whole heck of a lot of light, but it's not almost completely black looking like it is here, or um, this back lid on the kettle here. This dot that you see on the lid right there is just a, a company logo. Uh, I'm not gonna bother with that. That's the, the company that made it, GSI, stamps their logo on the lid. So. In order to best translate where I am observing, where the light is the strongest versus where the light is the weakest, is here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start just making, um, just to demonstrate, I'm going to start just making a whole bunch of these motherfuckers like this in the same curvature as the rest of the object because if I just go in straight lines that contrast with these curves it's going to look flat and stupid. It's a three-dimensional object. Even though you're drawing on a flat surface you got to be careful when going with straight lines. Just go ni nice and soft nice and easy try to match or complement the curves of the object and, or the kettle that I've just created. That way you still maintain that nice rounded appearance and some measure of depth and surface and volume and value, which you will see shortly as I continue to draw this kettle. So we have the area where there's the light is shining right back at us and we have the areas where there's not a whole heck of a lot of light at all. Again, from where the camera is positioned, it looks different to you than it does to me, seated maybe about a foot to the left of the camera. So I'm going to draw what I am looking at. Nice, consistent, and if you go outside the edge of your uh, kettle or your boundary, blueprint, whatever that you've created, um, that's okay because as long as you're doing the nice, soft, gentle stroke lines, you can erase any exterior later on, uh, which I'll show you how to do. It's, it's pretty simple, really. So nice, gentle, <coughs> excuse me, I burped. Uh, nice, gentle lines complementing the curvature and nice and easy so that so that we don't have too much contrast except at the bottom just nice and easy start slow and then only work your way up as fast as you are comfortable with uh, at your own pace and distance, so to speak. Now on the other side, gonna do the exact same thing. Gonna start at the edge and curve my way inward. See what I mean? This, uh, there's no solid backing to the sketch pad either, so it kind of wobbles in my hand a little bit. Might distort it just a little bit. This is more or less what I'm talking about. Not terribly many straight lines. I can very easily later on erase this 
the, like coloring outside the lines. I kind of hated coloring books as a kid because grown-ups would get on your ass about coloring outside the lines or not coloring within the lines. No, fuck that. I can crayons not erasable, but colored pencils are. So if I go outside the lines, I can erase that later on. And you know what? If I go outside the lines anyway, maybe I want to go outside the lines. So fuck you. Anyway. Coloring books are kind of stupid. <laughs> um, well, I mean, kids don't know any better, but, you know, it kind of trains your brain to not deviate from an expected plan. When I was a kid, though, my parents got me something called the Anti-Sketchbook, which was basically freeform, hey, create your own image based on this prompt or this suggestion and then color it in however you want to. Like One of the pages that stuck out the most to me was, what do you think houses will look like in the future? Draw one on this imaginary map. And I did, and I drew this like SimCity style, arcology, biodome kind of thing. Yeah, anyway. Um, don't worry about coloring or sketching outside the lines because as long as you're not doing this hard-edged shit right off the bat, you will be just fine. Let's get back to drawing the rest of the kettle. Now this angled surface in the band here at which the light looks different, to me it looks slightly darker than it probably does on the camera. So nice and easy, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I actually like eating lemons, although I know it's not good for my teeth. Maybe just a little bit harder press on the surface than other areas, but still going at a nice, easy pace and keeping curvature consistent. And this edge here is going to be a little bit of pain in my ass, but you know what? It's just a demo. It's not the end of the fucking world. And then again from the spout, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be really delicate with this this area right here, because this little tiny divot of space here I can probably color in or fill in with a little bit of a harder press of the pencil, because there's not as much light reaching those delicate little spaces, those happy, happy little spaces. So from where I'm sitting, the narrow band of the kettle looks slightly darker than, say, the rest of it. And of course, we have the underside. Oops. And the outside edge. And now, what's probably going to be the most complicated part is going to be the mostly flat surface of the lid of the kettle. Um, now, when I've been saying keep your curves consistent in relationship to the rest of the object you're drawing, this is where it's going to get difficult because while the lid is not completely flat on the surface from the top down, there is still a bit of a curved edge. It kind of looks like a drum, cymbal drum, uh, like you see with a drum kit. I'm sure I've got a couple of musician subscribers. Uh, Captain Andy's a musician. He would probably know what I'm talking about or how to describe that shape. Like a cymbal, like you would see with, with drums. Not like, like a cymbal, like you would draw a cymbal on something. Um, cymbals are a whole different ball game than this. So there is a curved edge at the edge of the kettle, of course, but it's also, the angle of the lid is also pointing ever so slightly upward, like a really broad flat cone where the top has just been chopped off and a D-ring slapped on the top of it. So from what I'm looking at, there's a very narrow band of light reflection right about here. Shit, I bumped my kettle. Um, anyway, that narrow band is kind of focus, like, tapering to a point, kind of like a really broad cone. So same concept applies. However, 
I'm going to have to do it just a little bit differently than I have been with the main body of the kettle. That way I'm keeping my curves consistent, but do you see how I'm ever so slowly flattening out my, my uh, line strokes as I get toward, like, I guess you could call it the equator between these two um, edges here? These two broad flat edges are the basically the boundaries of the kettle lid or even the kettle itself. So when you're depicting a flat surface, that part needs to be as flat as reasonably possible while still maintaining consistent curved edges. Now one side is just a little bit darker than the other. That's okay. Flatten out, curve. Flatten out in the middle, curve at the bottom. Can you see what I'm can you see what I'm doing here? If you can if this cheap ass camera will focus, if you can see the direction of the strokes of the pencil that I'm making, um, you can see what I'm talking about. See how the uh, the lines are curved at the bottom, and then the closer that I get to the center, the more they very slowly straighten out until I go back up to the top. Curve, straighten, straight, curve again. Um, I'm not going to bother completing this particular drawing because I think this tutorial's taken longer than I originally planned anyway, but um, more or less looks like a tea kettle. So the basic idea is taking a good long look at what it is you want to draw, thinking about its relationship to reality, basically, and then translating it kind of like you would translate a visual language. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not very good at metaphors. Anyway, this has been a drawing tutorial. This is Drawing Shit 101. I hope you learned something today. I might make more of these in the future if I have time. Be good to each other. Uh, don't be an asshole. Happy New Year. Bye-bye.